I, I will say a little bit about democracy and monarchy in the course of my talk too, but uh, the subject is uh, exploitation uh, or slightly differently formulated, who exploits who and how. Um, and we start out with Marx's theory of exploitation to show what is right and what is wrong about that theory and then offer an alternative view on exploitation. Um, you are basically familiar with the Marxian uh, theory. Um, Marx uh, uh, tells us that mankind goes through various stages, necessarily so. Uh, slavery, then feudalism, then capitalism, and then socialism. And he claims that three of these stages are characterized by the existence of exploitation, and exploitation then disappears um, in socialism. Now, as far as the first two stages are concerned, um, that is, slavery, we do not have to argue whether Marx's description is correct. That's probably incorrect also as uh, a description of the course of history, but nonetheless, uh, it is certainly correct to say that slavery is a system where exploitation exists. There's a slave master and a slave, and the slave master exploits the slave. So there's no debate about that. Um, the second stage is feudalism, and there he argues that serfs that are tied to the soil and cannot uh, run away from the lord who oversees them, that that is characterized by um, exploitation also. Again, uh, classical liberals uh, agree with Marx as far as these two stages are concerned. Not, again, as far as descriptions of history are concerned, but with respect to the characterization that these stages are characterized by exploitation. Now comes um, the stage of capitalism, and Marx argues that Despite the fact that laborers are um, pre-laborers, namely they can work or not work for some employer, um, capitalism is also characterized by exploitation. Now what is his argument for the existence of exploitation under a system where laborers can or decide not to work for somebody else? His argument is correct as far as it goes. He points out the following thing. Um, let's assume we have a worker who works in an apple orchard or so, and his payment is also in the form of apples. Um, so he produces, let's say, 100 apples per week, uh, and his wage payment consists only of 80 apples that he receives. And then Marx points out this difference, 80 apples he receives as wage uh, payment and 100 apples he produces. This difference of 20 apples uh, is the surplus value that the capitalist exploits, extracts from, uh, from the labor. Now it is correct, the observation, um, that the wage earner is paid less than the value of the product that he produces is certainly a correct observation. The question is whether this constitutes exploitation or not. And the answer is it does not, ex uh, it, it does not constitute exploitation for the following reason. Uh, we have to ask to be the question, uh, why did the laborer agree to such a deal? Um, and the answer is, the laborer agreed to this deal despite the fact that he knows uh, I can also get 100 apples paid provided that I am the owner of the apple orchard, I have plant, planted the trees, and then if I plant the trees and am the owner of the apple orchard, then of course my remuneration would be the full 100 apples that will be produced in the course of a week. So why didn't he do this? Why didn't he insist I get 100? The answer is he would have had to wait longer to get 100. Namely, it would have taken longer to build the apple orchard 
in order to get the 100 apples. Instead, he doesn't have to wait that long. He decides in order to uh, get quicker to my result, to my wages, I only accept 80 uh, and sacrifice 20. Uh, this is a phenomenon of time preference. Present goods or goods in the immediate uh, future are more valuable than future goods, goods in the far uh, in the far distance. So what the laborer demonstrates is simply the preference of 80 apples in the immediate present over 100 apples in the distant uh, in the distant future that he could have received if he had become a capitalist owner of an apple orchard and so forth himself. So because of that, there is no exploitation uh, whatsoever. Now, now I want to present an alternative theory of exploitation, um, the libertarian theory or the liberal theory of exploitation. As I indicated, as far as uh, slavery and uh, serfdom is concerned, they agree, but they say capitalism is not characterized by exploitation. Um, the surplus value is a result of time preference, preferring present goods over, uh, over future goods. But um, libertarians still think that in systems that we refer to as capitalism, there does exist exploitation also, except not exploitation by employers of employees, but exploitation by the state and the agents of the state vis-à-vis um, -vis people who live outside of the state, who are not members of the state um, apparatus. In order to explain this, let me first um, explain the difference between um, productive uh, activities and unproductive activities. Um, productive activities are all those activities that benefit at least one individual without making anyone else worse off as a result of this activity. And unproductive activities are activities that benefit one individual at least at the expense uh, of someone else. Now, a description of what activities are productive activities and what activities are unproductive activities. The first form of productive activities is what we call original appropriation, the activity that Locke spoke about, uh, of homesteading something. A person, for the very first time, takes into possession something that was previously unowned by anyone. Um, why does he do this? Because he thinks by appropriating something that was nobody's property before, that was unowned, I am better off. Does he take anything away from other individuals by doing this? Does he do this at the expense of someone else? The answer is no, he doesn't do that at the expense of someone else. Everyone else was had the possibility of appropriating these resources too. They didn't do it. They demonstrated through their actions that they did not attach any value to this object that was appropriated by me for the first time. I did not take anything away from them. Uh, everything else is still available to them just as before. So one person is better off. No one else is made worse off because nothing is taken away from anyone else. The second form of productive activity is now I use my originally appropriated resources and produce something with the help of these things, with my labor and mix my labor with originally appropriated things. Um, if I do not physically damage in the course of the production process the property of someone else, then I am made better off because people only produce because they think that um, whatever they produce is more valuable than the input that goes into 
the production process. One person is better off. Was any, anything taken away from anybody else? And the answer is no, everybody owns precisely the same goods that they owned before. Their supply of goods is exactly the same as before. One person is made better off because something more valuable was brought about as a result of production. Nobody else is made worse off. And the third productive activity is simply voluntary exchange. A voluntary exchange of property only takes place if both individuals, both exchange partners expect to be better off uh, the goods go from the hands of those who value them less into the hands uh, of those who value them more. Two individuals are made better off, but as a result of the trade between two individuals, everybody else in the world has exactly the same possessions as they had before. No one is made worse off. Two individuals gain. So those are the productive ways of earning a living making yourself better off. What are the unproductive ways? You can recall unproductive activities are those activities where one individual benefits but at the expense of damaging uh, someone else. If I take away from someone an object that he has originally appropriated against his will, then of course I am better off. But the person who has originally appropriated this object is made worse off. So this is an unproductive activity. If I take away what somebody else has produced, then of course I, who takes it away, am better off. But the producer of the product is made worse off. Uh, and of course every coercive exchange uh, in contrast to voluntary exchanges, this also characterized by the fact that one person is made better off and the other person um, is, made, um, uh, is made worse off. Um, so unproductive activities then are the expropriation of original appropriators, uh, the expropriation of producers, that can be the full expropriation or that can be the partial expropriation, <coughs> Um, and uh, any type of coercive, ex coercive exchange. What is the general effect of exploitation defined like this? That is, exploitation as unproductive activities. Um, the general effect is the more exploitation there is, the more expropriation of original producers, uh, of original appropriators, uh, the more expropriation of producers, the less original appropriation will take place and the less production will take place. When we look now at what type of people engage in unproductive activities, in exploitative activities that reduce the level of productive activities, then we can distinguish between two classes of individuals. On the one hand, of course, plain criminals. Um, who hit other people on the, on the head, uh, rob them, rape them, and so forth. Um, that is under no dispute. Practically everybody agrees that these people engage in exploitative activities, in unproductive activities, and thereby exploit others. The second group is the group um, that uh, makes up the state, um, the state apparatus. Um, now people will object that there is a tremendous difference between playing criminals, uh, stealing goods from others, and governments or states taking goods from other individuals in the form of taxes, for instance. And there are some other, other forms as well that I come to a little bit later. But the first one is, of course, the form of Taxes. Um, now there is of course some truth in the statement that there is a difference between criminals and states, um, but the difference is actually one that makes states look even worse than plain criminals. Um, let me just give you an example that was first presented by Lysander Spooner, an American libertarian 
in the 19th century, uh, who told the following story. Um, imagine that you are uh, traveling along the road and somebody jumps from behind the bushes and stops you um, and says, uh, your money or your life. And then you hand him your money. And what does the criminal then do? The criminal then disappears. Uh, he runs away into the woodworks. And as far as you are concerned, you are happy that he does this. Um, and you have the possibility of preparing yourself the next time for attacks such as this and possibly defending you the next time. Now imagine the same scenario, you drive along and somebody comes and stops you and uh, demands your money um, and once he is done um, stealing your money, then he does not disappear into um, the woodworks, but he says, uh, next week we will see each other again, um, uh, or next month, or next year, and so forth, when the next income declaration has to occur, and so forth. So he is not doing what you would like him to do, disappear, but he becomes an institutionalized robber. Um, who would you prefer to meet on the road? Someone that you can defend yourself against in the future or someone that you know you will come again and again and again. This is indeed an important difference between a state on the one hand and a plain criminal on the other hand, but it is certainly not a difference that lets the state look particularly good. Um, the second point I want to make is um, people frequently then argue, but you have to recognize that a state is not, one state is not like any other state. States are different. Um, and of course we can admit that also. Um, just as there are bad robbers and good robbers, so there can also be comparatively good states and comparatively bad states. Um, again, an example. Um, a friend of mine uh, went to an ATM machine uh, and uh, uh, once he had his money out, uh, somebody was standing behind him with a knife and asked him to hand over his uh, 300 euros uh, that he had received out of the ATM machine. Um, and. Um, my friend then started to argue with him. So he gave him the $300 and said, but you just late at night, uh, I had planned to go out and have a few beers afterwards, and now there's no possibility that I, that I can get any beer. Uh, and um, the mugger uh, then agreed to give him $20 or 20 euros back of his own money. Um, <laughs> Now, my friend was, of course, very happy in this, in this situation. Uh, <coughs> yes, I would have been happy, uh, happy also. Um, this is a good state. Um, it can also happen, of course, that you start negotiating in this way, uh, and uh, instead of giving you uh, a small proportion of your money, of your own money back, uh, that he will kick your teeth out or do something even worse to you. This is obviously a not so good uh, state. That might be the difference between, let's say, something like the United States or Great Britain or Germany, the good states, so to speak, that give part of the money back to you, uh, and something like the former Soviet Union uh, or East Germany, where they would also kick your teeth out uh, on top of <coughs> robbing you first. Um, okay, now to the question, how do these institutions like states come into existence? How can people get away with institutionalized robbery? Um, now, in one way, the answer is, well, why are there states? Um, in some sense, 
the answer is very easy. Um, and people have given very complicated <coughs> explanations why states come into existence. Um, but fundamentally, the answer is very easy. Uh, it is very interesting, very lucrative, very nice if you can live at other people's expense. Um, it is not difficult to imagine that there might be people out there who would love to institutionalized, to engage in institutionalized robbery of other people and live off them. Um, you could ask the same question, why is there slavery? Uh, again, people have given very complicated explanations for why is there slavery. The answer is, well, if, you, if I'm the slave master and you are the slave, uh, there's a very simple explanation. It's nice for me to be the slave master and you are the slave. I live off your exp uh, on, on your expense. Um, but how can they get away with this? Um, not because, this is the standard line, not because uh, states are necessary in order to create peace. Uh, quite to the contrary, as I will explain in a second. Um, states actually are institutions that create conflicts and then present themselves as a solution to a problem that they themselves have created in the first place. Again, a small story might be useful in order to illustrate this point. Um, let's say we have a, a group of people um, who want to start an extortion racket. Um, they go to the store owners and tell the store owners, you need protection. Uh, I know life is dangerous in this world uh, and I'm here to protect you. Um, and then the store owner might say, uh, I feel quite safe, um, nothing much has happened and if something happened, I'm prepared to defend myself. And the, and the people disappear. Uh, next day, the store owner comes to his store and sees that all his windows are smashed. Uh, the store is vandalized and so forth. And a few hours later, the same people reappear on the scene and ask the store owner the same question. Um, do you need protection? Um, and now the store owner gradually begins to get the idea what is going on. Um, and he says, oh, I see the point. Uh, yes, of course, I'm willing to pay you something so that you will give me protection, meaning that you will not smash my windows and vandalize my store tomorrow. Um, now, what would we expect this protection racket that has begun its work like this to do in order to stay in business? They must offer something of value to the person that they protect and who pays taxes to them. What do they offer them in return? Now, obviously, in every territory, there can be only one institutionalized protection racket. You cannot have competition in the field of protection rackets. If there would be dozens of protection rackets operating in the same territory, there is simply, simply nothing left that you can steal and rob and so forth. So every protection racket has, of course, an immediate interest to be a monopolist protection racket in a particular area. And this implies, of course, that the protection racket will protect the store owner from other potential protection rackets, from other plain criminals that come along. That is, they do deliver, indeed, some sort of service. But we can also see that they have an incentive, of course, not to be too good in combating crime committed by other individuals. As a matter of fact, their interest would be there should be a stable level of criminal activities going on 
because only if there's a stable level of uh, criminality going on uh, do the people have the feeling we do need this protection racket in order to keep this menace in, uh, in check. Um, so there is some sort of service delivered on the part of the protection racket. Um, the second thing, all, sta all states emerge somehow like this and go now by and large through the same sequence of steps. Obviously, the next thing that the protection racket must do is they must also not only monopolize violence, they must monopolize also um, judgeships. They must monopolize the judicial system. Imagine in this protected area, there are still different judges operating. Then it would become very quickly apparent that what the protection racket does will be condemned by various judges, by various arbitrators as something that is illegitimate. So what you must do is eliminate all possible alternative judges in your territory. All judges must become part of the protection racket itself. And then, of course, they will find that whatever the protection racket does, whenever they collect their taxes and so forth, that that is perfectly legitimate, is only uh, the just compensation for the uh, wonderful protection that they receive um, from, uh, from this institution and so forth. So, monopol monopolization of the judicial system is the next, is the next step. Um, the next step is uh, to monopolize um, traffic and communication systems. You see, uh, the protection rackets, the agents of the protection rackets to, who come and want to collect their money, uh, still must move on roads and uh, paths that are owned by other people. Um, they must get, gain entrance to the premises where they begin their looting activities. Um, in order to make sure, however, that they have, can enter every house, every premise, without any difficulty whatsoever, it is necessary that streets, which initially were privately owned, must become public property, must become the property owned and controlled by the protection racket itself. Then the employees, the agents of the protection racket can enter any premise without any difficulty whatsoever. Um, next point in order to yeah, in order to gain legitimacy for the protection racket is to monopolize the educational system. Um, yet initially, of course, education was nothing that uh, was in the hands of the state that was either privately organized or by church, churches, similar institutions. Um, what the state needs, however, is the correct training of the people. Um, we emphasize how important, how important a favorable public opinion is. Um, the protection racket consists only of a relatively small number of people, and those people who are exploited by them are a huge majority of people. Um, how can you, um, for a long period of time, um, oppress a large majority even though you yourself are only a small minority. And the answer to this has been given hundreds of years ago by 
David Hume, many people before Etienne de la Boite, um, only by opinion. That is, only if you get some sort of cooperation on the part of the exploited, um, so that they do not resist the attempts to continuously rob you and exploit you. And how can you create this favorable public opinion? That is, how can you get the idea across that somehow what the protection racket does is necessary and beneficial <coughs> to you? And the answer is by education. Um, you must monopolize the schooling, first elementary schooling, then of course also university education. All institutions must be at least licensed so that uh, the right doctrines are instilled <coughs> in the people, doctrines such as, you all know this, without the state there would be only chaos. <coughs> Nobody would be able to produce anything. The state is necessary in order to create peace among mankind. Um, the Hobbesian, the Hobbesian scenario, and only if we have the state who does a war of everyone against everyone else come to uh, come to an end. Um, Martin Martin Luther, the, um, in Germany. Uh, was a major figure in introdu uh, persuading uh, persuading the uh, rulers uh, how important it was to also have full control over uh, over the educational system uh, to nationalize to socialize so to speak the educational institutions and he used the argument just as the state needs to train its Soldiers with physical training, so everybody needs good mental training in order to become obedient, uh, obedient citizens. Um, and it is easy, in a way, for the state to accomplish this takeover of the educational system, because intellectuals, the teachers in these institutions um, are people who have a very precarious existence. The demand for educational services is very yeah, uh, unstable. Um, and what the state can do, of course, is offer intellectuals uh, safe employment. And in return for the safe employment that intellectuals get, uh, they then deliver the goods, namely um, the uh, appropriate propaganda. How important, uh, how important the state is. I come back to um, uh, to intellectuals a little bit later again. Um, the next. Um, uh, the next step that all states went through brings a huge advance in the degree of exploitation. That comes with the monopolization <coughs> of money and banking. Um, uh, states have basically two sources of income nowadays. One is taxation. And the other one is printing up money, that is engaging in uh, the same activity that a counterfeiter uh, engages in. Uh, you can create money out of thin air, basically. It costs almost nothing to print it, so to speak. Um, and then you can turn around and buy yourself some real assets with it. Imagine you would have this power you would be, and you realize that every state has reached this power. We have not a single state where it is not the case that they have a bank, a central bank, that has a monopoly of issuing money. Nobody else can print money except 
they can do it. Everybody else is a criminal who does it. Imagine I would make you the sole printer of British pounds. Nobody else can do it. What would you do? And the answer is, of course, you will start printing immediately. Uh, it costs you nothing. You can turn around, buy yourself a Mercedes and all the rest of it. Not only that, you will also realize that you have far more friends than you ever imagined who also come to you and say, look, you have, seem to have the magic wand. Um, Mercedes for me would be nice too, or a BMW, or I need a bigger house than the one that I'm living in uh, right now, so please help me. Um, the central banks in every Western country are the biggest employers, for instance, of economists. Um, universities, but central banks employ even more economists than any other institution. Um, these economists, of course, now are used as propagandists in order to explain to you how useful this activity of the state is to be able to print money out of nothing. And of course they have a very selfish reason. Imagine they would not explain this. Then they would be out of a job very quickly. So it is easy to see again why they would cooperate in a scheme such as this. Let me digress for a moment and briefly address the question does the current financial crisis indicate a failure of capitalism or is that not a failure of the state again? Um, now, look at it this way. When you ask normal people um, how banks can give loans, then most people think and look. I as a naive person thought that myself when I was young too. It's like you can only extend a loan to somebody if you have previously somebody who has saved up the money. So somebody must save it and then these saved funds can be given to somebody else. Um, no risky loans can be given away like this. Uh, you will be very careful to whom you loan the money because you need the savings uh, in order to, to do it. Um, and deposit banks, if you have a deposit accounts, uh, deposit accounts, most people think, are accounts where you put your money in the bank and you remain the owner of the money that you put in the bank. That's what a deposit account is. If you have a savings account, then you know, of course, I have saved, I cannot immediately get it back. This will be loaned out. Because it is loaned out, I will earn interest on it. Um, now, you can, however, as a banker, be tempted to do this. You can be tempted to simply issue tickets. If you deposit money in a bank, you get a deposit ticket. And these deposit tickets, people accept in exchange if they have absolutely no doubt um, that they can be redeemed into the real thing sitting in the bank. Um, what banks can do is they can issue fake tickets or they can loan out, so to speak, the deposits that you made um, so that people think, I own my deposit that I have in my deposit bank and at the same time the money is actually loaned out and the bank earns interest. You realize what the danger is in this situation. If the owner of the deposit would come and want to get his money back and the money is loaned out and has not been returned, then the bank is bankrupt. It cannot, cannot work. Now, as long as you have competing private banks that do this sort of stuff, that engage in fractional reserve banking, that is to say, they do not have as much money in the bank as they say that they do. They cannot even, while they might try this, it is a very dangerous thing to do. Because any note, any fake note, any uncovered note that comes into the hands of someone who banks with a different bank, 
will deposit this node in his bank, and then the process, of course, it is called adverse clearing. That is, his bank will then go to the bank that issued these fake notes, ask for redemption, and the bank will have a liquidity crisis. So, under a system of so-called free banking, we have no central bank, we have competing banks, but they engage in fractional reserve banking. It is very difficult to do this. So all bankers basically lobbied to institute a central bank which would allow them to engage in coordinated inflation, in coordinated expansion of the money, money supply. This central bank, and I mentioned that all states have this, this central bank is then the only one that can bail out the banks that get into a liquidity crisis. But only because you know there is a central bank in existence, will banks then expand riskier and riskier and riskier loans uh, because they know if the crisis comes. That is, if the depositors appear, want to have their money back, the money is not there, it is loaned out, will not be paid back by those people who have received the loans because bad loans have been given. There is always a central bank that bails me out. So, the crisis that we have right now is precisely caused by the existence of a central bank and even more strictly speaking, by the existence of something like fractional reserve banking. We use a slightly different approach to explain what the problem with fractional reserve banking is. Fractional reserve banking allows, so to speak, the practice of printing up more property titles than there is property. Um, look, you can have a car and you don't take possession of the car. So you have a title to a car, but the car is somehow standing in the car, in the car lot. Uh, the owner of the car lot can rent out this car even though you are the owner of the car and collects fees for renting out the car. If I come, however, and want to take possession of my car to which I have a title, then the car is not there. More titles to property are brought into existence than property exists. In no other area except in the field of money is this considered to be a legitimate practice. In the field of uh, warehousing um, uh, corn or wheat, or whatever, this type of practice is considered to be illegal. In the practice, in the field of banking, of money, it is considered to be uh, a legal activity. So this, this explains also why they are exploiters, so to speak, outside of the state apparatus. The big bankers themselves are in cahoots with the state, are standing behind the institution of the central bank because they realize this allows them a coordinated inflation which enriches them, brings about the danger of bank runs, but they know that the bank runs, at least under paper money standard, can be mastered, so to speak, by printing up the un unlimited uh, liquidity once a crisis breaks up. I'll come back to your question, whatever that, that was. Um, as I said, this was a, some sort of digression. Um, now I want to say a few words um, about uh, the difference between monarchical states and democratic states. So all states are exploitative. Um, but democratic states are even more exploitative um, than monarchical, uh, classical monarchical states are. Uh, for several reasons. One reason is, as long as you have just one king um, being in charge of this protection racket, so to speak, everybody knows 
he is a king, uh, we are his subjects, uh, I cannot become king, um, and I resist, of course, every attempt on the part of the king to increase his level of exploitation. There is resistance against it because, you know, he is different. Uh, I cannot become him. Uh, on the other hand, under a democracy, everybody can now become, so to speak, king. Uh, everybody can become prime minister. There is open entry into this position of being the head of, uh, the head of state. Um, so you still might not like the fact that you are exploited, that you are taxed to the hilt. But you realize, I might actually be on the receiving end, instead of being always the one who pays. And that consoles you to a certain extent um, uh, over the fact that you have to do something that you might not like like to do because you might also benefit uh, from it. Um, the second, so resistance is higher under monarchy against increased exploitation and lower under democratic uh, conditions. Um, the second difference, important difference is once you have democracy in place, one man, one vote, um, the demands for income redistribution will become far greater than they were under monarchical conditions. Like two little stories that indicate this. Uh, imagine, for instance, we would have a world democracy. One man, one vote, one woman, one vote, on a worldwide scale, we have a world state then what you can predict is we will get some sort of Indian-Chinese coalition government simply by virtue of the number of people. And what will this democratically elected government do in order to be re-elected? They will, of course, decide that a massive income redistribution from the Western world to the developing world is necessary. Uh, after all, they have almost nothing and we have plenty of stuff, so a huge income redistribution will be set in motion. Precisely the same thing has taken place in, within all individual states in the course of the 19th century as the franchise was gradually expanded. Initially, the franchise was restricted to property owners, actually to major property owners, and the age restrictions were quite high. Uh, because people had an idea of what would happen if everybody can vote. That is, those people who have nothing or have little will vote themselves the property of those who have more than they themselves have. This is precisely what happened in England, what happened in Germany, what happened in the United States, and so forth. Uh, that is, classical liberal parties, which were initially at the beginning of uh, up to the mid-19th century or so, the dominant political force became increasingly less important uh, and socialist parties or social democratic parties became more important and even the program of the classical liberal parties gradually changed uh, to social liberal parties as more and more people uh, were allowed to participate in, um, in, the, in the voting. Um, Another important difference that I should point, point out is that under democratic regimes, um, the rulers become more short-sighted. They are interested more in short-term exploitation as compared to uh, monarchical regimes. For the following reason, imagine the, the king considers the country, so to speak, as his private property. Um, whereas a democratic politician is a temporary caretaker of the country. Uh, and that has profound, different, uh, profound implications as far as his behavior is concerned. Again, imagine in one situation I would make you the owner of a house. That is to say, you can sell the house in the market and 
realize what price you would get for the house. You can determine who inherits your house and so forth. And in the other case, you have an identical house. I say you are for four years the caretaker of this house. You can take advantage of this house. Um, but you cannot pass it on to future generations, nor can you sell it in the market. It is public property. You are just caretaking. Would your behavior, behavior be different? And the answer is, yes, of course it would. Uh, the owner, whatever he does with the house, will always be interested in what will be the repercussions of what I do right now with the house as far as the capital value of the house is concerned. Uh, what would be the consequences for the price that I can get if I were to sell the house in the market? He will not want to engage in capital consumption, so to speak. He wants to preserve the value of the house because he can capture the value in the form of a higher price. Or he can pass it on as an intact piece of property to the next generation. But if you, for four years, are in charge of the house, you don't own it, what is your interest then? Then your interest is you want to maximize your current income at the expense of capital value. It doesn't matter whether the value of the house falls dramatically in the market, because after all, you cannot sell it in the market. It isn't yours. But you can increase, of course, your current income. Look, I, can put, I could put 20 people in the house as renters and collect more rent from them, with the consequence that maybe after a year or two, the house is in ruins. Um, on the other hand, if I just take one nice married couple and rent the house out to them, uh, then my rental income will be significantly lower, uh, but the capital value will be uh, will remain in, intact. The owner behaves like this. The caretaker behaves like I have to exploit what I am taking care of in as fast a time as possible, because who knows what will happen, um, what will happen in uh, in the future. Um, in addition, uh, democracy has the effect of bringing the worst people to the top. Um, look, a king becomes king by accident of birth, um, because. It is an accident that makes him the king. Uh, does not exclude, or does not make it impossible that this guy might be an evil person. Many kings were evil people. After all, we are talking here about two evil systems, two exploitative, exploitative systems. So, yes, of course, kings can be bad guys. Um, but if they are bad guys, what typically happens to them is the dynasty becomes worried that if this guy misbehaves like he does, they might lose all the power and they will surround him with people who control, control <coughs> the maniacs to a certain extent. And if, if even that doesn't help, they might even determine one of their own family to kill the guy off. Um, on the other hand, because he comes to power by accident of birth, he can also be a nice man. Um, a generous guy who just might exploit a little bit but by and large leaves people alone. We have also examples of, of this. Now compare this to democratic conditions. Um, competition is not always good. Competition is always good when it comes to the production of goods. Then, if, it, if we are dealing with the production of goods, then competition has a result of uh, increasing uh, the quality of products and lowering the cost of production. But competition is not good when it comes to the production of bads. That is, those things that states produce. You can recall. States live of taxes and of counterfeiting activities. Those are not goods. So we don't want to have competition in that area. 
in the, when it comes to the production of bats, monopoly is good. Competition, uh, when it comes to the production of bats, um, monopoly is good and competition is, uh, is bad. Uh, you would not want to have competition who is the person who is the best at beating up other people. Uh, or competition who is best, the best commandante of some concentration camp. There you would want to have inefficient people, as inefficient as they can possibly be. Um, but democracy is of course competition in the production of bads. Who rises to the top? Smart people who are good at demagoguery. Uh, who promises everything under the sun. Uh, knowing full well that there's no way that they can possibly keep their promises. Imagine you would be a politician who would say, I will not take any money from the rich and give it to the poor. Um, I will not engage in any income redistribution. Uh, can anyone who just has a, uh, a campaign with these slogans ever hope to become elected to any high office? And the answer that is absolutely unthinkable. That might be something that can happen in a small village. And that because of that, people like Rousseau, who were defenders of democracy, of course, thought always of democracy only in very small units, where everyone knows everyone else and is afraid, is ashamed that they vote themselves the property of others. But in a society with millions and millions of people, where nobody knows from whom you steal, of course, all moral inhibitions uh, disappear and people are willing to vote themselves the property of everybody else who they think is better off than they, than they themselves. So under democracy you have almost a guarantee that only evil characters will ever rise to the top. And in addition, the likelihood that those evil characters will be killed off like kings were killed off when they turned out to be evil people is relatively low because people always hope, oh, it will be just the next election and in the next election then finally the good guy will come to power. My guy will come to power instead of the bad guy that is currently um, running the business. Okay. Um, now, what can we do about all this? What we can do about all this is that people have to develop some, yeah, what we can have, clear class consciousness. You know that Marx, of course, had this idea of people have to have a class consciousness as well. Um, his idea was, of course, uh, the workers have to feel we are the exploited, and the capitalists are the exploiters, and then by uniting uh, in their common uh, consciousness, self, the class consciousness, uh, you could shake off the yoke of, uh, of the exploiters. Now, what we need is, we need also some clear class consciousness. Um, there's, there do exist exploiters and exploited. It has nothing to do with capitalists and workers, it has to do with state agents, and state agents are also sometimes people who operate outside of the realm of the state apparatus, as you recall, the, the banks in particular, and on the other hand, people who are the export. Um, how can we just make that visible to people who belongs to one group than who belongs to the other group. Um, by a simple thought experiment, at least that is useful to come to this uh, class consciousness. The thought experiment is, imagine for a second that taxes would be eliminated. What would then happen? Um, would everybody's income go up from after tax income to before tax income. That is from uh, net income to gross income. And the answer is no, of course not. Some people's income would then go up from 
net income to gross income, from after-tax income to before-tax income. Other people's income would go down from after-tax income to zero, or to close to zero. Um, obviously, we currently do something with the taxes. We pay huge amounts of people out of taxes. Um, teachers do not pay taxes. Teachers are paid out of taxes. University professors do not pay taxes. They are paid out of taxes. There is a fiction. The fiction is they get an income, they get a income statement that looks like everybody else's. Because people are interested in equality before the law. They also get a pay slip that says uh, before tax income, tax meet minus taxes, and then after tax income. But their entire net income that they receive is, of course, paid out of taxes, and in this sense, they do not pay taxes at all. Now, who are these people? The entire state sector, all public employees, all, te all teachers, all professors, all members, uh, all members of uh, parliament, all welfare recipients, of course, and so forth. Um, this, it is important to, to realize this because that helps you understand certain phenomena that otherwise uh, make no sense. You see, why is not everybody against taxes? After all, aren't taxes forced contributions that you must make. But we realize, of course, that there are large numbers in the population who are in favor of raising taxes. Um, university professors are almost always in favor of raising taxes. Uh, school teachers are almost always in favor of raising taxes. Of course, they present themselves as benevolent people. Who feel, who feel with the people. Um, they say, I must pay taxes too. But I'm still in favor of raising the taxes because I'm a social person. <coughs> Whereas there are other people who are greedy individuals and do not want to pay their taxes. Once you realize that they don't pay taxes at all, and their advocacy of higher taxes means only they advocate that they should get higher salaries, then you realize what sort of fraud is uh, going on there. Um, so once we have developed a clear-cut class consciousness, there are people who rip other people off, and you must realize who these people are and who is being ripped off. Then there might be a chance that the state can be rolled back. As long as this class consciousness that does not exist in the minds of people, clearly, there is absolutely no hope and the power of the state will continue to rise. Okay, with this I'll, I'll stop. Thank you very much. Would you like to take some questions? Yeah, I'll take some questions. Yeah. 15 minutes or so? Yeah. Maybe I'll let you pick them. Yeah, okay. Uh, <coughs> Gordon Brown, um, in the recent crisis, has talked about the need for a new Bretton Woods style global agreement. I was just wondering what you thought that had the potential to end up in, in terms of your analysis of. Okay. Very quick. You, you see that the, the Bretton Woods system was characterized by the fact that. Gold still played the minor role in the entire system, insofar as foreign central banks could redeem $35 into an ounce of gold. Um, and the Bretton Woods system uh, collapsed because the United States inflated continuously the U.S. dollar. Uh, these dollar amounts partially ended up in the hands of foreign central banks and then induced by uh, economic advisor of uh, Charles de Gaulle, Jacques Rueff, um, the French realized 
the Americans do not have enough gold in order to redeem their dollars, thirty-five dollars per ounce of gold, and a run set in on the American Central Bank. Um, and then uh, under uh, under Nixon, yeah, well, uh, yeah, it was under Nixon, um, the um, uh, the American Central Bank basically declared bankruptcy. They said, we will no longer redeem. Um, you can keep you can keep, keep the paper dollars, but the obligation that we assumed under the Bretton Woods Agreement to redeem them uh, 35 per ounce of gold is no longer kept. Now that made it possible that after 1971, worldwide inflation, of course, increased even more than it in had increased before. It's like before there was always this tie to gold. <coughs> Since 1971, there is no tie to anything. So all countries can basically inflate as much as they want. What they still have to worry about is, however, if I inflate faster than some other country, then my currency will fall in the currency market against other, against other currencies. And the way out of this problem is what the European Union tried to do, so to speak. The German mark was always more stable than other currencies in Europe, not because of any virtue of the Germans, but because of the fact that there was twice hyperinflation in Germany. The public was a little bit more sensitive towards this type of issue. Um, and the other European uh, countries wanted to inflate faster, but always with the danger that their currency would devalue. So the idea was what we have to create is a Euro central European bank that allows that the euro can inf inflate faster than the least inflating currency that existed previously, the German, the German mark. The ultimate solution would be to create a world central bank, of course controlled somehow mostly by the United States, I guess, um, and then because this world currency, world paper currency, can by definition not depreciate against any, any other currency, we would have inflation like we have never seen it, never seen it before. So what Gordon Brown, whatever these people want to set up, is not, as far as I can see, a return to some form of gold standard. Um, even the Bretton Woods was already very diluted gold standard. It was already a long march in the direction of allowing more inflation as compared to genuine gold standards. Um, so whatever whatever they have in mind is not tying paper currency, currencies to some sort of commodity, but probably creating some still more central organizations that allow even more inflation to take place in the future. So I think he's probably have exactly the opposite in mind from having sound money. He wants to have even less sound money. This, the entire plans that these Europeans have in the United States with uh, calling big conferences and setting up a new system, um, uh, my fear is that will be a further step in the direction of creating a world paper currency. Which of course then aggravates the problem even big to even higher levels than it exists right now. But money has to be taken completely out of the hands of uh, of government. The, the classical liberal position was not not because we are in favor of gold or we love gold or whatever it is. It, the idea was it has to be a commodity that cannot be deliberately produced out of nothing. And it has to be something that is not in the hands of the state. That is the only guarantee to have sound money, money that does not lose uh, purchasing power continuously. Yeah, yeah, please. Given that the Bank of England before the Second World War was an independent private institution and that it ran as a central bank, um, a fractional reserve system, and that there wasn't any runs on the banking system since um, the late uh, 19th century. Is it not possible then to have a central bank, a 
private central bank without um, being a vassal of the state um, running a fractional um, reserve system in the world. And furthermore, given that scenery is a minimal part of most states' income, that it isn't uh, a debauchment of the currency that occurs in, in the modern times of the world. And first of all, I'm not quite sure it's that it's a minor, minor part. Um, but look, the Bank of England uh, also went off the gold standard uh, in the 1930s, like all central banks did. Right? Uh, again, I'm not familiar with British banking history, but uh, the United States went off the gold standard in 1933, uh, and Britain uh, immediately afterwards was well, well, the same. The same one. What? 1931. 31, even before. Um, so that indicates quite clearly that, of course, that there were bank runs also. Uh, and in order to avert these bank runs, uh, they had to go off, off the gold standard domestically. And then after World War II, um, this, this small remnant of the gold standard was still kept. Um, in the in the Breton in the Breton Wood system, um, but central banks cannot come into existence uh, such as this. That is, banks that have a monopoly on the issue of money. Uh, what you can have is you can have competing banks, each issuing, so to speak, their own notes, but backed by backed by something. Um, you w- you would have to explain. How it is possible that people would ever accept a piece of paper as payment in the first in the first place? You know, one of the great insights of Ludwig von Mises was to show that a paper money can never come in, into existence up all. Um, let's say I offer you a piece of a piece of paper, you would not even know what the purchasing power of it is. Pieces of paper were only accepted because initially pieces of paper were titles to something else, to a commodity. Only because of that did they gain acceptance. Once they are widely accepted paper notes, then you can cut the tie between gold and paper, and the paper can float on its own. But you can never introduce from the outset, so to speak, a pure paper currency backed by nothing except paper. So in this sense, the Central Bank of England, the Central Bank of Germany, all of them are non-market institutions. They are institutions that are the result of a violent crime that was committed, the expropriation of the owners of the gold. I mean, Roosevelt, I know more about American banking history than I do the British, but what Roosevelt did was just simply saying, um, up until that that time, Americans could do what central banks could do <coughs> in 1971, that is, present $35 paper bags, paper, green bags, and receive an ounce of gold. And then when bank runs started setting in, then they said, okay, we keep all the gold, even though the gold was were deposited by private clients, and you can, and you can keep the money. And people who still had gold were forced under threat of uh, several years of uh, jail term to hand over all their gold to the, to the central government. So central banks are not normal institutions. They are criminal institutions from the outset. Otherwise, they can never come into existence. No central bank is, has ever come into existence by normal means without committing a violent act of expropriation. Yeah. I've got one, um, one, one um, larger question and then one very brief question I'd like to ask you afterwards. Um, the first question is, um, you seem to be assuming that um, capitalism is in some sense, in some sense prior to, um, to the existence of the state and the existence of government. Um, surely if you had a, a world order where um, the only thing that existed were capitalists, then it, it would be simply inevitable that um, some kind of 
violence would, would come to pass that would actually render that completely impossible. Um, but, no, what I'm property and law exist before states exist. Um, states are not institutions that bring about the existence of property and law. So, so how, how is the system going to be effectively policed without somebody having a monopoly? Okay, that, that's it. No. Look, in the international scenery, we have no monopoly currently either, right? We do not have a world government. Nonetheless, it does not mean that the, maybe that the relationships between German businessmen and British businessmen are less peaceful than the relationship between two British businessmen, um, despite the fact that there is no monopolist. Um, look, in Germany, we had until 1871, we had 39 states. Um, and after 1871, we had just one. There were not more conflicts in Germany before 71, 1871 than after. Um, as a matter of fact, if you have <coughs> if you have a monopolist of law and order, then you can predict that the price of law and the quality the price of law will continuously rise and the quality of law will continuously fall. Imagine. Imagine something like this. I tell you, in every case of conflict, whenever two people have a conflict, they must, they must come to you to arbitrate who is right and wrong. That includes even conflicts that involve yourself. That is, if you have a conflict with me, then you decide who is right and who is wrong. If I have a conflict with him, you also decide who is right and who is wrong. But if you have a conflict with me, you also decide who is right and wrong. So what, what you can predict is, in that case, you will actually cause conflicts, and then you decide them in your own favor. You will hit me on the head, then I complain about it, and then you say, I'm the judge. Of course, I was entirely justified. He looked at me in the wrong way, and that's the law that I lay down. And now he owes me such and such a sum of money in order for me to make this ridiculous judgment. This is, this is how states work. Look, if a policeman beats you up, and you complain that the policeman beats you up, who decides who is right and wrong? The judge who is employed by the same organization as the policeman. So you must have, in this area in particular, you must have competition. Competition between arbitrators, uh, judges, uh, and so forth. Because, precisely because this is one of the most important goods, law and order, justice. And to have a monopoly there is just a sheer disaster. But again, that, that it does work, you can see we do not have a world government. Are there more conflicts between citizens in Austria and in Germany who live in two adjacent villages? There might be only a kilometer between the people. Are there more conflicts between people who live in one village in Germany and Austria than between citizens who live in two Austrian villages, neighboring villages? And the answer, I have never heard that there are more conflicts between them. But that proves that you do not need a monopolist for this. We're um, slowly running out. I so think, maybe just one, or I think one more question, question. that should be it. Yeah. I always have a, a very simplistic question. I'm sure you've had it to you many, many times. Um, you say that you say that it's positive, but what would you say to me that there are many beneficial things that come out of this state, like free education and free healthcare, but a lot of people think that if those, if those goods weren't provided by the government, a lot of people wouldn't be able to purchase. First of all, they are not free, right? <laughs> it has to be paid out of taxes. But somebody pays the taxes. If somebody who wasn't paying taxes because they didn't have, they weren't buying, somebody who was disabled or somebody who was mentally ill and couldn't work and couldn't pay taxes. For that sort of stuff, you have you have societies that are not taxed, are wealthy societies, and then you have charity and churches and things of that nature. Uh, look. 
education is nothing that came into existence only because states did it. Education existed prior to states taking over education. There existed medical doctors before the British health system was introduced. There are many countries where private doctors still are allowed to operate and that have far better health care systems than you have in Britain. And you are famous for having one of the worst systems in the world. <laughs> Everything that people want, for which there is a demand, will arise in the market. And let me emphasize this. Whatever is funded out of taxes will be far more expensive than the same thing would be if it would be provided by a market. If I build a private school, then I spent my own money on it, and I will be frugal with my money. I, I'm very much concerned what will happen to my money, and I'm concerned if I recoup the money that I invested in. If I'm, on the other hand, a bureaucrat, I do not spend my own money. I spend other people's money on something. If you spend other people's money on something, you tend to be very generous. Um, is, then you think the school should have this, the school should have that. Wouldn't that be wonderful if there would be nicer carpets, better, uh, better desks, more computers, and all the rest of it? After all, it's not my money. So, if you build a street, the same thing. If you build a private street, you will be very much concerned about the price of the product and the quality of the product. On the other hand, if you build a public street, you have this perversity in every, every European country, I'm sure that this exists in Britain the same, because you, you order companies to build the street that guarantee that only the highest possible wages will be paid. That the unions that say, you must pay your worker at least whatever, 20 pounds an hour, otherwise you will get, not get the contract to build the street. Imagine this idiocy. So, I build a house, and then some two, two people come and make me an offer. One says, okay, I built you the house here for 100,000 100, pounds, and somebody else says, okay, I, I will charge you 200,000 pounds, but I promise you that I pay my workers extra payment. Um, would you then build the house, the 200,000 200, pound house, only because you know, oh, but the workers were paid 50, 50 pounds an hour, whereas the other one, exploitation, they only paid them 10, 10 pounds an hour. Of course I would go for the 10 pounds an hour and get my house for $100,000. All public buildings are built according to this principle of only the highest wage needs to be paid. And as soon as they have finished building the road, then they start digging it up again and, uh, and, and, uh, and paving it over again. I mean, you see... I mean, this is not only in Britain the case. Is wherever you go, it's always the same. I think we should Here stop we now. I'm sorry. Right. Everyone, join me in thanking uh, Professor Hope very much. For coming